Well, good afternoon, and on behalf of the family, I want to thank you for coming out this afternoon as we remember the life of Jake Merrill. You know, it's, today's a hard day. Jake was someone who always had a smile on his face when I met with him. He full of life. He was a goofy, funny, and tragically, his life was just cut too short. And so today is hard. And yet I know today as well that you're going to hear about hope. That even in the midst of this tragic and hard time, we still have hope. And not only that, we have a Savior who is able to understand what we're going through and is able to comfort us in our time of need. And so right now, I'm just going to ask you to, to pray with me as we go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day because we know that you love us and that you can comfort us and that as Jake professed his faith in you, Lord, there's nothing that can separate him from your love. And so as hard as it is, we can be thankful and we can be grateful because your love is greater. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to us today, that you would comfort us. Lord, that you would heal us, and we know it's going to take time, but we have faith that you're able. So, Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for defeating death and sin so that we could have hope of eternity with you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Owens, and uh, I'm the pastor here at Gate City. And though Jake never got to formally join, I'd like to think of myself sincerely as, as Jake's pastor. Um, while we got to spend time together repeatedly and be able to have some conversations and talk to talk to each other about things that, that matter and of consequence and hearing each other's story. Uh, I was able to learn things about him that way, but uh, since his passing, being able to spend some time with Lizzie and with Jake's mom and his stepdad, uh, to hear more about Jake's story and what it was like for him growing up and what his 28 plus years uh, here, uh, what his full experience was. Now, Jake came into this world in September of 1992. and. Uh, he, was, he was born in, in Missouri and was growing up there. Uh, at that point, he was, he was the youngest of two children. Unfortunately, Jake's father also struggled with addiction. And what addiction does is that it destroys things. It destroys lives. It destroys relationships. And ultimately, it brought an end to his mom and dad's relationship. And so uh, Susan was left with two little boys, and Jake was just about two years old uh, as a single mom trying to, to figure out life and to make ends meet. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't too long before she was blessed to have Danny come into her life. And the two of them met, and they fell in love, and they got married. And uh, then they were able to have a blended family together between her kids and Danny's. And uh, truly, Danny became a, a father to Jake. Now, growing up, though, Jake was a, a precocious kid. And it doesn't mean necessarily that he would look for trouble, but he seemed to find it uh, sometimes fairly easy, uh, even at, at an early age. Uh, Susan was describing how his very first day at kindergarten, because you think, oh, kindergarten, what could go wrong in kindergarten? And so the very first day of kindergarten, she's at work and she gets a call from the school where she needs to go to the school because her kindergartner has gotten a little bit of trouble. And so she goes and Jake, this little kindergartner, so five years old, is sitting in the principal's office. And apparently some other little punk kid in his kindergarten class decided to push Jake. And Jake decided you shouldn't have to take that. And so he then explained to his kindergartner peer that if you do that again, I'll, I'll kill you. And so apparently, apparently teachers this day take that type of talk seriously. And so Jake, as a kindergartner, wound up in the principal's office. Um, that was the first day of kindergarten. The last day of fifth grade, Jake uh, went, and I can say this because my wife and I, we've got six kids, five of them are boys. And let's just be honest, boys are dumb. They just really are. And so uh, but as, as a fifth grader, the last day of school, they're going to go out with a bang. They decided it'd be really funny, and everybody would love this if they would egg the teacher's car. It's always a brilliant idea, right? Who hasn't done that? And so uh, Jake and his little fifth grade friend decided to egg the teacher's car, and of course that was a colossally bad idea. And uh, needless to say, they got caught, and uh, fifth grade ended with a little more fireworks uh, than Jake ever thought 
uh, he would be experiencing. But generally, it was just not that type of thing, but just goofing off and talking and putting smiles on other people's faces and laughing. That's the type of thing that would get Jake in trouble at school. But for all the bravado that Jake would demonstrate, he was a, a guy that even from the earliest ages was terrified of storms. And Susan talked about how uh, he would always be the first to head to the basement anytime there was a clap of thunder. He, it, just, it just scared him to death. Uh, but by the time he was uh, started in high school, Jake began to work. And uh, over the years in high school, worked in a number of places. Uh, I think most of his time was spent working in the grocery business. That We don't have that here, but uh, in Missouri it's called Food for Less. And he worked for uh, Domino's delivering pizza and also for another company named Sealed Air. Uh, Jake was a fun-loving guy who could, who could and would light up a room when he came into it. He's someone that would put a smile on other people's faces, somebody that would actively think about, how can I do that? Is there something I could say? Is there some wisecrack I could make? Is there just something I could do that might cause them to smile? And in high school, though, uh, Jake began to experience something that candidly a lot of high schoolers do and the, their, the, the leash from mom and dad gets a little bit longer and so with some of that freedom begin to, to goof off and act all outside of uh, the bounds a little bit and begin to experiment a bit with alcohol and with marijuana but these days that's thought for many to be just so, well, just so routine and common and while it may be very common unfortunately among other things it can expose you not only to to other substances, but also other people that might uh, be negative influences on you. And such was the case with Jake. And not long after high school, Jacob began to struggle with heroin addiction. And I can't speak, and I'm grateful, I, I can't speak for what the experience of walking that road is. Uh, but I've had conversations repeatedly with Jake, I've talked with others, and consistently this is what you hear that these drugs have meaningful, meaningful impacts on how your mind and how your brain functions. And the addictive nature of these substances is just off the charts and a single exposure, just say, I'm gonna try that one time. Well, that, that can alter the totality of your experience going forward. You know, unfortunately, it is the case in our lives that what we experience is not ultimately determined by intention. What we experience in life is determined by choices. Intentions matter, excuse me, choices matter in ways that intentions don't. Let me give an example. If, if I decided this afternoon that I wanted to go to Atlanta, but if I get on I-40 headed west, you know what? I'll never get to Atlanta. I would be also grateful for that. I don't want to go to Atlanta, but if for some reason I made the mistake and wanted to go to Atlanta, if I get on I-40 west, I will never ever get there, regardless of my intention because intention does not determine destination, choices actually do. We need to be honest and say that no one ever intends to become addicted. No one ever wakes up one morning and decides, you know what, I'd like to be an addict. I would, I would love to have my body just for regular function dependent on in, in injecting these substances. That doesn't happen. But what typically happens is that there is the intention just to experiment one time. Let me just see what this is like. It, that, that stuff won't happen to me. I won't become addicted to this. I won't become dependent on this. But unfortunately, the choice to experiment can absolutely be a trap, a trap that can cost you everything. Now, Jake was having real struggles with the challenge that was created by the trap of drugs and drug addiction. And this created a lot of, parent, a lot of challenges for his parents. Some of you might have been down that road yourself and can testify to it, but you're faced with this dilemma because you love your kid and you want to, to love them through this, you want to help, uh, but you want to make sure also that you're not operating in ways that enable them to continue on the path that they're on. And so the love that you wind up having to demonstrate often times becomes best described as being tough love. And that's, that's what had to happen with, uh, with, uh, with Jake's parents. And, uh, eventually, Jake wound up going to a rehab facility in Florida, and uh, that was going well, but unfortunately, he checked out too early, went back home thinking he was ready to be home, and began to struggle again, and then finally returned to Florida, uh, back to this inpatient rehab facility. Uh, his last e experience there proved very pivotal for him because it was on the very first day uh, that he had an important encounter with a young lady who was also there uh, walking through her own experiences with addiction. Now, of course, that, that young lady was Lizzie Nance. And 
she was there. Jake gets there, but he's not happy to be there. He's not, he doesn't want to be there. He did, however, notice this, uh, this young girl over there with some blonde hair. He did take notice of that, but decided, I don't want to be here, and announces to those that are running the facility, I I'm leaving. I'm just checking out of this place. And so th they're trying to, to coax him into staying, encouraging him to stay. And so he says, well, let me talk to that blonde girl over there. Well, so that blonde girl over there, Lizzie, came over there and talked to him. And this is their first real uh, meeting, their first real conversation. And she said, what are you doing? You know, you've, you've got to be here. You need this. You need this help. And thankfully, he listened to her, and he stayed. And so the two of them were there for the next 18 months before uh, they were able to leave that facility. Uh, some of you know what it's like to experience it, and I think they would both uh, have described it. For them, the experience was love at first sight. And uh, I asked Lizzie the other day, I said, you know, you couldn't leave the facility while you're there during that 18-month period, so what was your first date like? And you think about that. If you can't go on a, a date with somebody you really care about, when you get the chance to do something uh, where you've got your, your freedom and you can go anywhere that you want to, what would you do? And Honestly, I think Jake probably had been thinking about that for 18 long months. What would this first date be? Because it was special. I mean, remarkably special. They went, they went to Walmart. And, but that was their first date. And in truth, that didn't really matter because they had already developed a meaningful love relationship for each other. At that point, though, they need to figure out what they're going to do. Lizzie uh, was, is from the Greensboro area, and her family was here, and she was going to be returning home. And all Jacob knew is that where she was, he wanted to be uh, there with her. And so he followed her to Greensboro. And uh, I guess it was about a year and a half ago that I met Lizzie and Jake for the first time. And Lizzie first, uh, they began coming here to Gate City. And long story short, Lizzie made a decision uh, to begin a personal relationship with Jesus. And uh, she did that, and I had the pleasure of being able to baptize her. And I remember Jake was here that day. He, he made it a point to be here that day. And I believe it was that week or the following week uh, that he wanted to, to sit down and talk with me. And so uh, just in my office over there, Jake's sitting on the couch, and we began to talk. He begins to share with me his story. And I, I began to share with him some of what I'm going to be able to share with you today in just a little bit uh, about how it is that we can have a personal relationship, a personal connection with Jesus that changes everything. And that day, make, Jake, excuse me, Jake made the decision to, to begin a relationship with Jesus. And we continued to talk. We would meet uh, and following up after that. And he said, you know, I'd like to get baptized, but I don't want to get baptized right now because I want to demonstrate to Lizzie. I want to demonstrate to myself. I want to demonstrate to everybody. That this isn't just a passing fancy, that I'm actually in this, that I actually mean this, that I'm acting out of sincerity. But in truth, that's how Jake was. He was not a guy of pretense. He wasn't someone to put on airs. He wasn't someone that was out to impress. He, he's just who he was. And he really did care for other people. He loved his friends. He loved his family. Uh, but I believe the one that he really loved with all of his heart was Lizzie. And just a little over a month ago, the two of them were able to welcome a little girl, Penelope, into the world. And he was super excited about her entrance into the world. Uh, the, the song that you heard uh, at the beginning of the service played that every day uh, as she was in the womb. So that uh, whether or not she had any idea, she, that, the, the thought behind that song, she was exposed to through the totality of, of Lizzie's pregnancy. And he was so excited about being a father. But unfortunately, there was always a thief kind of looking over the shoulder, the thief of addiction, a thief that wants to rob you and anyone of everything. And while there was so much that was going on that was so good in their lives, and they had plans to spend the rest of their lives together, uh, plans to watch together this little grow, girl grow up and encourage her and to teach her and to train her, plans to continue working with the city. Jake had a job with the city of Greensboro in the water department that he loved, loved his co-workers. Uh, so much was going so well. The shadow of addiction, though, was still looming. And in the end, those drugs took from him everything that mattered, and especially to this family and to those of you friends who are gathered here today, it took from you someone that was dearest on earth to you. You know, everything about this, the fact that we're here today, everything about this is tragic. But I do not want in your mind or heart or even in the service, I don't want everything to be defined. And I certainly don't want Jacob's life 
or his memory to be defined by addiction. It absolutely robbed him of what could have been and should have been, but it did not define him. Jacob was a happy, caring, compassionate, plain-spoken, charming, and from my perspective, just kind of a breath of fresh air type of person. And so what more can we say than this? That we are and we have been fortunate to have for 28 plus years our time here spent with Jacob Merrill. And in response, all we can say is that we just wish it had been longer. May God bless the memory of Jacob Merrill. Spend some real time trying to give some thought as to what to share with you today in terms of a message. Over the years, I've preached a lot of funerals. I've done the business end of 200 of them at this point. And uh, the vast majority of those are for individuals who had long, full lives. Well, that's, that's not why we're here today, and that, that's not true today. So, so what is it that we say? Well, for one thing, I believe we need to state the obvious, which is that, that we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't. Jacob should not be living in our memories. He ought to still be living with us. And I hope desperately, desperately hope that the tragedy of Jacob's passing serves as a clear warning. And the weight of his absence serves as a colossal warning to any of you who are here today or if someone is watching this video later online as it, as it gets shared. Please let his passing be a warning to you about the danger of drug use. Truly, it will rob you of everything. If you're struggling, know that there is help, that there are absolutely people who care for you, who want to help you, who want to come alongside you, that there are resources and that that a struggle with addiction does not have to be something that you just have to wallow in, that you can get help and it can be overcome. It will not be easy, but it is possible. There is help that is available. But remind yourself of this, that, that help cannot be given when the need is not known. So these people that you know care about you, who care about you, share with them. Just open your mouth and say, listen, I am struggling because help is available. The other thing I would want you to know is this. It's not simply that, that help is available, but even on a day where there's so much sadness, where there's so much grief and the reality of loss is so significant, there absolutely is hope. There's hope. By that, I, I don't simply mean that there is hope for people who are struggling with addiction, while that is absolutely true. That the hope that I'm thinking of and have in mind is bigger than hope with addiction. You know, there are stacks of places that I could point you to in the Bible that underscore this, but I, I just briefly today want to direct your attention to one passage, in fact, just one verse of Scripture. And it comes to us in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. Let me set the stage for you. Now, so we're in the left-hand side of the Bible at this point. You've got the nation of Israel led by a guy named David. He's the nation's second king. And things are going really well for the nation. Things are going really well for David. Uh, life is going great. But long story short, David makes the choice to, to uh, have an affair with a married woman. Uh, she's married to one of his soldiers who is out fighting in battle. Well, that encounter results in a pregnancy, a pregnancy that would be difficult to explain while the husband is gone. And long story short, what happens is that David issues the order for her husband to be sent onto the front lines. And once he gets there, for the rest of the soldiers to pull back so that he, well, he just dies in battle. Well, people around that day probably thought that this man named Uriah died as a consequence of war. That happens. It's tragic. It's awful, but it happens. But in truth, this was not a tragic loss in war. This was an act of premeditation. Uriah lost his life because David essentially ordered his murder. So now you've got a guy that has tried to cover up his adultery with murder. But so far, so good, because now he can take Uriah's wife, whose name was Bathsheba, he can take her as his own. And so if she has a baby, well, then no one will be any wiser. No one will have any idea. Well, uh, what they thought, or what David thought, that he could cover up 
uh, was certainly known by God, and there are no secrets before him. But long story short, Bathsheba, who David now has taken as his wife, she gives birth to a son. And we're not sure exactly how long it is, but very quickly this little baby gets, gets sick, deathly ill, to the point where David is desperate with grief and worry. He is fasting and praying, and that chapter in, in 2 Samuel describes how he just lays on the ground. He is despondent, and even though he's the king of Israel, he can have anything that he wants and the best food and uh, the finest drinks, all that stuff. Uh, his servants are afraid to even go to him because he won't eat, he won't drink. They're afraid to approach him because he is so despondent with grief, concerned about this baby whose life is hanging in the balance. Well, long story short, that little baby dies. And after that, he eats, perhaps for the first time in a matter of, of days or weeks. And the servants ask David a question. They're kind of, I don't understand, like you wouldn't eat while he was still here, but now that he's gone, you, you won't. And David answers with this statement. Now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. You say, geez, Michael, thank you for that. That was wonderfully depressing. That's a horrible story. What, 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 where is hope in that? I believe that there is significant and there's profound hope in that single statement where he says, in short, he, speaking of the child who has passed, he cannot return to me, but he says, I can go to him. That's where hope ultimately is, I believe, found. Let me flesh that out for you. Jacob Merrill, I believe, was a good guy. I appreciated his transparency, his candor, his affability. He cared sincerely for people. I think he tried to help others in ways that he could. I believe, though, in spite of that, he did make certainly some tragic choices, choices that led him to struggle with addiction. But in truth, to know Jake was to love Jake, to like Jake. And I say this today with a straight face and sincerely with a clear conscience. I believe that Jake is not with us, but he is not lost. When something is lost, you don't know where it is. I believe that Jake is not with us because I believe that Jake Merrill is in heaven today. But as I say that, I don't believe it's because Jake was a good guy who could light up a room. I don't say it because he was kind to people and animals. I don't say it because he was an avid Chiefs fan. I don't say it because he loved his family. I believe that Jacob Merrill is in heaven today for this singular and simple reason. He made a decision to begin a personal relationship with Jesus. What's, what's all that about? I mean, how does that happen? Let me just share with you today what I shared with Jake in my office a little over a year ago. Every one of us is a screw-up. You are. I am. We all are. And we all have struggles. There's, there, there's, there's stuff that we are all prone to do because every single one of us, in fact, the Bible describes it this way, that, that we have the, the God's laws written on our heart. We come into this world with so much stuff that it's even wired into us that we know that we shouldn't do, but consistently we make choices where we know what the right is. We choose not to do that. And the Bible has a very simple word for that. It calls it sin. And it's easy for us to say, well, it's not that big a deal. We rationalize bad choices all the time. Like, for example, lying and dishonesty, we say it was, it's just a little white lie. Or we try to rationalize it with intention and say, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. I, I, was, I was intending to do something very different, something much better. But sin is a big deal, and certainly a big deal to God for this reason. He understands what it does to us. And one of the most significant things that sin does to us is that it separates us from God. It means that we don't have a relationship with the one who made us. And it also means that we're not going where the one who made us is. Let me just put it in plain, simple terms. Because of my sin and yours, heaven is not part of the equation. That being said, you could go, to, go up to Dollar Tree. Just start talking to people on the sidewalk as they come out and ask this question. Hey, when your time on this earth is over, what do you think is going to happen? The vast majority of people are going to say this. I think, I hope, I like, I'd like to think, I hope to think, I expect, I'm going to go to heaven. Well, here's the question. On what basis would anyone say that? Most people would say this, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because in the end it's kind of like there's a scale. And so I've done some bad stuff. I know that. I'll admit to that. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But I've done some good stuff. And hopefully in the end it's enough to get there. Or just 
You know, just because I, I think that's where, where everybody goes. And we love the thoughts of heaven. We love the, the, the pictures that have been painted of heaven. And uh, we like Bible verses that talk about streets of gold and, and crystal seas and all this kind of, We love that. And no more death and no more tears. We love all of that stuff. But let me be very plain. The only reason that anyone is talking about heaven is because the one who made it told us about it. That's it. And the one who told us about it told us how to get there. And there's not a stack of ways to get there. There's a singular way to get there. And it involves dealing with our sin. Unfortunately, the mess that we have made, we can't fix it. I'm going to give you some very depressing news. The bad stuff that you do, you can't do enough good to make it go away. The bad that Jacob did, there's not enough good. He could have lived to be 128 years old, and there's not enough good that makes it go away. Our good deeds don't make our bad deeds just act as though they didn't exist. So we've got the sin problem that's our own making, but we can't do enough good to make it go away. That's bad news. That's terrible news, but here's really good news. The one who made you loves you. He really does. God cares about you. You matter to Him. He wants a relationship with you now. He wants you to be with Him in heaven one day. But this sin problem has got to get taken care of. And so the solution was going to be dependent on Him because we couldn't fix it on our own. And so the solution involved God sending Jesus, His own Son, into the world. And Jesus did some amazing stuff. You're likely familiar with that. You've heard about some of the miracles that Jesus did and some of the ways in which He showed kindness and love and compassion. He did all that stuff. But the most important thing that Jesus did was to give His life on a cross. Not because He had done something wrong, but because I had. You had. Because Jacob did. And the Bible tells us that in dying, Jesus paid the penalty for my sin and yours. He did. Well, that's... that's a lot of good news. That's, that's great news, but it still leaves us with a problem. We've got this whole death thing that has to be dealt with. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus died, that He was buried, but thankfully that wasn't the end of the story, but that three days later He experienced a resurrection, victory over death, and then offers both of those, payment for your sin and victory over death as a singular gift the Bible calls salvation. Well, how do you get it? You can't put it in a box at Christmas time. You can't uh, put it in a gift bag. You can't hold it in your hands. It's an intangible gift. How do you get it? Well, in, in just one verse, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul says this, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. Two things, I believe, are going on in that passage. One's easier than the other. Part of it is, just, is believing. I wasn't around when Jesus walked here. I wasn't around to see Him crucified. I wasn't around to see Him resurrected. But I accept that. I believe that by faith. I could spend the rest of the afternoon telling you why I believe that's a reasonable choice. It's not just a step into the dark. It's a reasoned belief. That's the easy part. The other part is where it describes about confessing Jesus as Lord. The word Lord is a term that's synonymous with master. Master means that you're in charge, that you're calling the shots. So I, if I could summarize it this way, it is that it, you're believing what Jesus did to the point that you make the decision, I'm willing to follow you. You, you get to set the rules and I, and I follow them. That, that you, you illuminate the path and I follow your direction. That doesn't mean that I'm going to do it part perfectly, but I, I, am, I, I so believe this that I'm willing to follow you as you guide me in life. What I'm sharing with you today, I shared with Jacob, and Jacob made a decision just on the other side of that wall to begin a personal relationship with Jesus. Because of that, I believe sincerely that while Jacob left this world entirely too soon, when he did, I believe it was to go to heaven. Now that he is gone, we are certainly left to grieve the fact that He's not still here with us. But it is my hope that you might use the words that David used, where you can say, He can't come to me, but I'm going to go to Him. Listen, the only way that you can do that is for yourself. You, somebody can't give it to you, but you yourself make a decision just like Jacob did to begin a personal relationship with Christ. Let me just say as a church, 
We would love to help you with that. If you're here today and you would like some more information or if you want to call us later, you want to sit down and talk, you want to call us, whatever, in any way that we possibly can, we want to help you with that because I'm telling you, outside of that, there's no hope to offer today. But there is hope. There is hope because when a person knows Jesus, our lives don't just end when we leave here. We get eternity with Him in heaven. That, I believe, is where Jacob is. And so while it is that there, is, there are tears, there's sadness and there's gaping holes probably in your heart from the void that is left by Jacob's absence, there can be and there should be real hope that Jacob is with the Lord today. And my hope and my prayer is this, that as lousy as it is to have to come to a memorial service to honor the life of a 28-year-old, as horrible as it is to say goodbye to a son, a fiancé, a, a friend, a co-worker, as lousy as that is, that God might somehow use this to get your attention, to remind you of this fact. At some point, you're going to have a service very similar to this. If those you leave behind care enough about you, they're going to have a service in your honor. What will they be able to say that day? My hope is that they'll say that you shared a similar decision that Jacob made to begin a personal relationship with Jesus. And because of that, that when you leave this world, you go to be with Him. Won't you pray with me? God, we want to come to you to say uh, thank you. Thank you that in a whole sea of darkness and real and meaningful tears of sadness that hope can be found because you made hope possible. Problems that we made, it made messes that we created, you loved us enough to bring the solution. Lord, I, I take real comfort, and my hope is that this family takes real comfort that because of the decision Jacob made, he is with you today. But I pray, God, that his passing, while tragic in his, the time, certainly untimely, that it might remind us all about the insecurities and the frailties of life and that we make sure we are prepared to leave this world in the only way that we can is by coming to know and follow you. Lord, I pray for Lizzie as she goes forward raising Penelope. God, that you might undergird her with strength, especially in these days and weeks and months to come. Uh, for Susan and Danny, for the entire family, I pray, God, that you would comfort them in ways that only you can. For friends and co-workers and neighbors and for all those of us that know and care for this family, that you might burden, them, burden us with them, put them on our minds at the time we need to make a phone call or visit to put that card in the mail, that you might use us to encourage them and help them to get through this most difficult time in life. But in the end, Lord, we want to say thank you. While we weren't ready to say say goodbye to Jacob, we do thank you for every day that we had. Certainly we wish that there had been more, but my hope is by following his example of faith that we say while he can't come to us, one day we will go to him. Thank you for the life and the memory of Jacob Merrill. We say this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. On behalf of the family, let me thank you sincerely for being here today. You don't uh, show up here by chance or by accident and they don't take your presence here for granted. I know some of you might have gotten a chance to be able to speak to them before the service, but if you hadn't, uh, they're going to be available here at the front. You can just come by. Obviously, remember, we've got this whole pandemic thing going on, and so if you don't have a mask, don't you get near this baby. And so I'll be doing another funeral today if you do that. So uh, uh, you might have to do a lot of distance hugging. I know that, 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 uh, that you want to do, do that, but just, just uh, please remember everything that's going on. But God bless you again. Thank you for being here today. So you can come by and greet the family.